Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TMA Ask the Expert podcast series. Today's session is entitled Living with Myelitis, TM, AFM, NMO, ON, and ADEM, Navigating Life, School, College, Work, and Beyond. My name is Roberta Pesce, and I am the Research and Project Manager at the Transverse Myelitis Association. We are a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune diseases. You can learn more about us by going to our website at myelitis.org. Sam Huge from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, TM, and NMO Center will be moderating our podcast today. A few housekeeping pieces before we start. This podcast is being recorded and will be made available on the TMA website at myelitis.org. And it can also be downloaded via iTunes. During the call, if you have any additional questions, please send them to us via our Facebook page at facebook.com slash myelitis. Great. Thanks, Roberta. The 2015 TMA Ask the Expert podcast series is made possible through the generous support of Chagai Pharmaceutical Company. Chagai Pharmaceuticals is conducting clinical studies to create original and innovative drugs, both in the United States and overseas, to address unmet medical needs and neurological disorders where the level of pharmaceutical contribution and satisfaction concerning patient treatment remains low. For today's podcast, we are joined by Paralympic athletes Amanda McRory and Dr. Anjali Forber-Pratt. Dr. Forber-Pratt is an assistant professor at the Department of Human and Organizational Development at Vanderbilt University. Her research looks at issues surrounding identity, equity, and empowerment for individuals who are different in some way with a large focus on disability. She was also a member of Team USA at the 2008 and 2012 Paralympic Games. Dr. Forber Pratt acquired transverse myelitis as an infant. She helps to develop and further Paralympic sport in developing nations and is actively involved in the world of disability sport across the United States. Amanda McGrory was diagnosed with transverse myelitis in 1991 at the age of five. As a child, she was introduced to wheelchair sports and continued through high school, securing an athletic scholarship to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2004. A two-time Paralympian in track and field, Amanda is a full-time athlete living in Savoy, Illinois, and training for the Rio de Janeiro Paralympic Games at the National Training Center for Wheelchair, Track, and Road Racing. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anjali first to just kind of uh, want both of both you and Amanda to just kind of give the listeners today um, uh, tell us your stories, uh, uh, your history with transverse myelitis, and and how you've made it to uh, to your successful lives today. So, Anjali, would you like to start? I'd love to. Thank you so much, everybody who's on the call today, and we're so excited to be here and, and to share some of our stories with you. Um, you know, for me, I was actually adopted. Um, I was born in Calcutta, India, and um, two months when I was two months old, I was uh, adopted by a family in Massachusetts, and I arrived as an otherwise uh, otherwise healthy individual um, at two months old. And two months after I was here in the United States, so at age four months, I got sick with transverse myelitis, and that's what left me paralyzed uh, from the waist down. Um, at the time, uh, I was it was diagnosed at around the T10 level, and um, and and um, my my legs just really didn't didn't really respond to to any type of um, any type of stimulation and so forth at, at that point, and so it was considered a complete paralysis at T10 um, at age four months old. Um, being so young when I acquired transverse myelitis, this this life and and um, and navigating life in a wheelchair and so forth is pretty much all that I've ever known. Um, and but I've ne- I've really never let that stop me. Um, I, I have was very fortunate to grow up in in a family that was extremely supportive of helping me to to reach my fullest potential and to live out my dreams and and so forth. And um, I was able to to start to learn how to navigate um, life and and the world from from a wheelchair. And we're going to talk a little bit more kind of throughout. Um, throughout today uh, about some of those some of those challenges some of those um, successes and and so forth Um, Amanda do you want to jump in with some of your story too absolutely Um, I was born a healthy baby just like Anjali um, until I got a a little bit older and started acquiring all sorts of allergies and sinus infections Um, my parents took me to a an allergist 
when I was five and did the full um, full board of allergy tests, all of that. I came back for an allergy shot, and then the next morning uh, is when the transverse myelitis struck. I woke up, everything was normal, walked downstairs, sat down on the sofa, my legs went tingly, um, and then I lost all sensation after that. So they took me to the emergency room, and I spent two full weeks going through every possible test you could imagine, uh, including the doctors who were convinced that I had given myself a spinal cord injury somehow by rolling off my bed that morning because they could find no inflammation, nothing wrong in any of the, the MRI, CT scans, none of the tests. Uh, So after a few months of rehab, I went back home and sunk into a pretty deep depression and battled depression and anorexia for quite a few years um, over control issues and and things related to to my disability and not knowing how to adapt to my new life until when I was about 11, got introduced to wheelchair sports, and the community I found through wheelchair sports really made the biggest difference. Um, I got the opportunity to see older, successful people with disabilities who had careers and families, um, were educated, drove cars, and that was something that I didn't have the the opportunity to see when I was younger, Uh, and that really, really made the difference for me. That's awesome. uh, Sorry, Sam. Uh, I was going to say those are very powerful stories, but keep talking. (laughs) <laughs> kind of just kind of just to add on to to the, to a little bit of Amanda's story um you know for me I I was very fortunate growing up in the in the Boston area where it was it being exposed to an event like it was the Boston Marathon which was what opened my eyes to the world of wheelchair sports um in in Massachusetts the Marathon Monday it's a basically a statewide holiday it's it's actually Patriots Day and so you don't go to school, you um, you know, you don't go to work and all this stuff. Everybody goes out to support this event. And I remember I was I was actually about five years old, and one of my first um, first memories of watching the Boston Marathon was you know going out to the curb with my brothers and my sister and my parents. And I just thought we were going to be out there watching these runners. And and I was you know not really the most excited about about this whole event. And, but my parents, for whatever reason, were so very excited for me to go out there and and to, to watch this race. And that was the first time that I saw people in racing wheelchairs go flying by, and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Because for me, in growing up in a relatively small town, um, having this disability, having transverse myelitis, being one of the only ones who used a wheelchair, I actually believed that everyone in the whole wide world had a disability, and that eventually it was going to be something that I would just outgrow and that I would one day be able to walk again. And it was it was very eye-opening for me as a five-year-old to realize that there were adults living with disabilities and who were doing amazing things. It just really kind of changed my entire perspective and and allowed me to, to then start to set goals and dreams for myself to be able to go to college, to be able to have a job, to be able to start a family, um, to go to school, and, and all of these different things. Um, but I also think that was it was really – it was really telling just being a young kid, and, and, it, and it shows the, the importance of needing to, to, to have those role models and those people to, to look up to, like, like what Amanda was talking about. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, the, the, not only support systems, but, but those examples that you can have to look at are, are very powerful. Um, uh, to start out uh, a little bit, so you both, had um were living with transverse myelitis as children um and so uh wondering what kind of interactions did you have with um your not only your family members but your peers growing up as children um uh how, was there difficulty in that and how did you how did you manage those kinds of interactions uh, um, amanda would you like to oh, sure i can absolutely do that Um, I think that my experience here might be a little bit different than Anjali's was because I had started as a kindergartner before I acquired transverse myelitis. So I did my first few months of kindergarten, disappeared for four months, and then came back to my kindergarten class in a wheelchair. Um, And I think that that was, it's, it's definitely a different experience acquiring a disability at a young age because I came back and in my hot ping wheel hot pink wheelchair with the key to the elevator, I was all of a sudden the most popular kid in school. 
everybody wanted to go for a ride and push me around and come with me to the elevator. So that was that was definitely um, probably probably a good thing. It wasn't until I got older um, that that begins to change, and kids are a little bit more wary around you because you're in a wheelchair and that's different and they don't know if different is good and maybe it's weird and they aren't so sure how to feel about it. Um, and I think that's really important. That was really important for me because that's when I also started to make uh, some friends who also had disabilities, which was cool because I had friends in school and I could always relate to my friends in school and they didn't treat me any differently. But there were some things about having a disability that they would just never be able to understand and some of the daily frustrations that I experienced. And so I had my sports friends and my other friends with disabilities who could understand those things and we could complain about the ice cream shops that we couldn't go to because they had stairs and we could complain about how all of our friends were out riding bikes and we couldn't do that. Um, and in addition to, to all of that, um, being able to bond over those things, I also learned a lot about the things that I still could do and different ways that these, these friends with disabilities uh, still participated in activities with their able-bodied friends. Yeah, and, and my story was a little bit different because from the moment that I entered school, I, I already ha you know was using leg braces and crutches and, and my wheelchair for long distances and so forth. And for me, I think that it was it was similar to to Amanda's story in that in that I I really relished in having both the balance of of friends at school who did not have disabilities, but then also friends who did have disabilities, um, you know, that were usually through a sports organization or, or other organizations outside of the school environment. In school, some of the challenges that that I that I found um, with interacting with peers, a lot of it was was the be getting invited to other kids' houses because a lot of times parents and or other children, if their house wasn't accessible, they would they would make the assumption that, oh, we can't invite Anjali to the birthday party or we can't invite her to come over to play without realizing that there are ways that we can, you know, make make it, the, you know, relatively accessible for me to for me to still come over and hang out and to have a good time and to just be a kid. And so a lot of times it ended up being having to be able to have those conversations up front with, a, you know, and so my mother would have those conversations with, um, with other mothers and parents and so forth about that. And so once I was able to finally find sort of a niche group of friends whose, whose parents were on board when, and didn't see any problem with helping me to get in and out of the house, you know, and so forth, um, then, that, then that was fine. As I got a little bit older and kids start to want to have sleepovers and things like that, um, the layers of complexity kind of add, got kind of added to that because um, in, until I became independent with my toileting and showering and bathing and all of that type of stuff, I, ha I would have to sort of purposely forget my sleeping bag so that my mom would be able to come to help me with those things. Um, and, and again, it, it took really through that, that building those relationships with some of the other parents. Um, and I was fortunate that two of my two who two of my very close friends, their moms happened to be nurses, and so they ended up s kind of approaching my mom and, and myself and said, "Look, like well, I'm will completely willing to help and and to to help you with cathing and to help with anything that that needs to be done if that's something that that you know that you're interested in." And so that once we finally kind of reached that point, that really that really helped to kind of level the playing field and to make me feel like I I could just be a kid going over to my friend's house having a sleepover. And, and 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 so forth. Um, in terms of interactions with my siblings and things like that, I, I have two brothers and a sister, um, and I have an older brother, and then the other two are, are younger than I am. And growing up, um, you know, we were all just brothers and sisters, and it was one of those things where my brother he he would always go off on what he would call these adventures. And whether sometimes the adventure would be climbing a tree, sometimes it would be building a fort in the backyard, sometimes it would be crossing the swamp. I mean, you never you never really knew what the adventure was going to be out in the neighborhood. But he was always inclusive, and he he it was never a, a doubt in his mind that that I would be left on the sidelines. He would you know climb the tree first and put a two by four on a uh, on a branch and then help me with a rope to <laughs> to be able to climb that same tree just to be able to participate in the same adventure and that he was. Um, and so I would say I was very fortunate with the interactions with with my siblings and so forth. Um, to, that, that that really made really made childhood and interacting with with my brothers and sisters all all quite normal. I completely forgot the family side of things. Um, I remember 
at the time I was too young to know any of this, but talking to my parents later, um, I remember my mom telling me that the, the doctors told her as I was coming out of rehab that it was very important to still treat me like I was just regular old Amanda, just like she did when I was an able-bodied child. Um, so I think that that really fostered my sense of independence. I still had chores growing up. I still had to do things for myself. I still got in trouble and yelled at and punished, just like like my siblings. And for my sisters, they are um, each five and then ten years younger than me. I have two younger sisters. And so they've actually known no difference. I've been in a wheelchair um, as long as either of them can remember. And they, just like my parents, treated me um, absolutely normal, no special treatment because of my disability, um, even to the point where they would sometimes take advantage of it a little bit maybe um, to hide things on the stairs or on higher shelves where they knew that I couldn't get them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, uh, everything that you're bringing up about uh, families is, is very interesting. When when we speak with um, um, parents of of children with TM and siblings, there, there's a lot of uh, a conversation about what they should or shouldn't do, or, or um, um, what uh, their child can or can't do, that kind of thing. And um, is there any any advice that you would have um, as adults who have lived with uh, TM since childhood and, and had these experiences um, with your families? Any advice you would give to the the parents and siblings of of those who might be listening, of of, of people with TM who who might be listening, um, to to help make the transition um, as a child into adulthood easier or or just more? Um, any advice you could give? Do you want to go first, Anj? Sure. Um, I would say just the the biggest piece of advice, particularly for parents, is to treat your son or daughter with TM the same way that you would any any other child in the family. Um, I also think that um, you know, and, and and that includes many of the things that Amanda was touching on, like making sure that that those kid, kids also have chores or held to held up to the same you know rules of the house and 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 so forth. Um, but I would also say also creating that safe space to be able to have those conversations when you are having a, a frustrating day or when you encounter something that's frustrating because of your disability. Um, and, and it's not, and, and I don't think that it, it's misconstrued as, as any type of really special treatment necessarily, but what it is, it's, 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 it's a way to validate that those emotions and those feelings are normal and that there, and because there are going to be frustrations. And, and unfortunately, I mean, we can't, we can't, you know, get rid of that. Um, that's just, that's just kind of par for the course. I think that is, that is 100% true. Um, and that safe base really gives kids, especially kids with disabilities, the opportunity to explore and to figure things out themselves. Um, whether they, they succeed or they fail, they can then come back and have the opportunity to talk about it and see what they can change, what they can do differently. Uh, I think the, it's really important to resist the urge to, to baby kids with disabilities because that just makes the shock of growing up and moving out and moving out into the real world that much harder. And Anjali and I have talked about this a lot. We've met we've met a lot of a lot of kids, a lot of teenagers um, who are are definitely not ready for that step. And I think that that's that's probably part of it. And just to add to that, I mean, some of the things that we're that we're that we've talked about, Amanda and I, um, offline, separate from this, is is what those specific things are. I mean, part of it is is being able to get yourself dressed in the morning and get ready for bed and to learn how to learn how to um, take care of your toileting and showering and doing your skin checks and things like that and 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 even you know maintaining your equipment whatever that might be whether it's your leg braces your crutches your wheelchair your walker um, you know but starting to starting to learn those those processes because because um, you know you're not always going to you're not always going to live under the roof of your parents and you're not always going to have them to to help you to to navigate all of that and so anything that parents can do um, to start to develop those those skills of autonomy I would highly recommend and and, and that'll look different depending on the age and and so forth of, of your son or daughter I mean for me I know um, I remember one example that, that my mom would always do for me was whenever I would be um, going to a doctor's appointment or, or you know, going to, for a checkup or whatever that might be or meeting a new specialist, she would have me do the first pass at filling out the forms on my own. 
And yes, yeah, she had to go back and fill in pieces that I didn't really know the answers to or or whatever, but at least at that at least by starting to get me engaged in that process, um it I, then wasn't completely foreign to me when all of a sudden that it was, you know, my responsibility. Mhm. Um speaking of the uh your point on self-care, um just wondering through from childhood into young adulthood, um, the process of, of learning self-care and uh, the recovery process with occupational therapy and physical therapy, um, how much of a role was physical therapy and occupational therapy, uh, uh, how much of a role was that in, in this kind of self-care learning uh, versus learning from your parents or other family members? So Amanda and our stories are going to be a little bit different, I think, on, on this one. Um, and so in my situation, um, you know, I actually never really, I don't have any vivid memories other than as I was recovering from surgeries of actually working with physical therapy or occupational therapy. So for me, I, I learned all of these skills and, and so forth through interacting with, with my mother and also through meeting other, other individuals with disabilities and asking them questions and trying to figure out what, what worked. Um, for me, I didn't, I didn't start self-cathing until I was uh, about 13 years old, and um, and so for me, um, prior to that, I um, I used the Crede method to empty my bladder, and that was something that my mother had had been doing for me up to the, up to that that point, and so she started to she was the one that really started to teach me how to how to do that and everything like that, and then when when the girl just made the decision to that that it was needed for me to move over to self cathing, I remember that I went and and you know they they taught me really. How to what it was all about at the hospital at, at that appointment, um, but the, in terms of any any subsequent follow up and so forth with OTs or PTs, um, unless it was unless I was recovering from surgery, it was all it was all stuff that that we just kind of figured out as we went along. So figuring out what what works best for me in the in the setup in my bathroom and um, in terms of like a shower bench and and that type of thing, um, it was all it was all just kind of figuring figuring it out by the seat of your pants. <laughs> so surprisingly enough, our stories are actually pretty similar here. Most of my formal PT and OT ended after the three months of rehab that I did at DuPont in Delaware, right after my diagnosis when I was five. I did a little bit of outpatient PT, and my mom would take me in before kindergarten in the mornings. But as soon as I finished up kindergarten, she and my, my doctors talked about things, and I was active enough as a child um, and curious enough and independent enough that they decided that there was really no need for any more formal physical therapy as long as I was staying active, um, doing my stretches, and hopefully getting up and walking around in my braces every once in a while, which I hated, that that would be good enough. Um, as far as bowel and uh, bladder programs and those sorts of things, I wanted to go to a sleepaway camp when I was seven years old. And in order to go away to the camp, I had to learn how to take care of everything myself. So that became a project in second grade for me. Um, and after that, apart from the um, every once in a while, little little problem with things, I was 100% independent. Nice. That's uh, that's interesting take on on you know growing up and learning learning the self care and, and and management of of your day to day lives. Um, moving forward from maybe young childhood, the transition to uh, high school years and and beyond. Uh, um, teen being a teenager can is difficult for anybody. Um, and so, wondering how uh, you two being uh, uh, having a disability moving into uh, the the woes of being a teenager, how what kind of issues you you came up against, and and how you handled them, and and maybe specifically how uh, how sport was used um, to to help you uh, get through that process. Yeah. So for me, um, as I was you know going through middle school and and getting ready for that transition to high school. Things just in terms of the my actual physical environment started to get a little bit more complicated um, because you start switching classes and the schools get bigger and so the distance that you're traveling is is becomes greater and so forth. So, like Amanda, at, 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 you know, through elementary school and a, and a little bit through middle school, I was also using leg braces and crutches and and so forth for some things and and then my wheelchair for others.
others. And But it just it started to become much harder to keep up with my friends at school. It had been much harder to get to class on time. Um, the, the textbooks also got heavier. And so I have vivid memories of, you know, tipping over in my leg braces and then being like a turtle on the back of your shell and you can't really figure out how to get up. Um, and so there was there was some all of those in kind of environmental changes kind of led 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 to the decision for me to to actually to use my wheelchair more permanently um, in school and to be able to to be able to 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 better interact with with that environment and so forth. Um, but it was also through during, at the same time having those friends outside of outside of school who had disabilities and where I would participate in in the Saturday sports clinic and and um, and 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 get to know the same challenges that other kids were facing and, and and how they were dealing with it too and so it was through conversations with other kids who who were either my age or slightly older and, and you started to learn kind of the tips and tricks of the trade and so i didn't know that for example i w i was it was a considered a reasonable accommodation under a 504 plan to be able to request for two sets of books one set of books that would that would actually stay in the classroom where where my class was being held and then one that was considered my home set of books and so there that was an accommodation that took care of the the struggles that i had with trying to carry and 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 um to fall over with with the books so that was that was definitely one example I definitely, um, once again, had a pretty similar experience to Anjali. I, my family moved when I was in third grade, and so I started third grade in a new school, but I stayed there all the way through high school. So I had pretty much the same group of friends um, from the time I was in third grade and then through, through elementary school into middle school and then the transition into high school. And I think that that definitely made things easier for me because it was it was in high school where I first started to notice um, that kids maybe were treating me a little bit differently uh, because my disability made them a little bit nervous and they weren't quite sure how to act around me. Um, kids will ask questions about anything and wheelchairs are cool and they want to play with them. I think it's when, when you get a little bit older, um, people aren't quite sure how to approach it. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to do the wrong thing. And so it was definitely helpful for me to, to have the same group of friends who I was already comfortable with. Um, I knew their families. I knew their siblings. And that was fantastic. At the same time, I was becoming more and more competitive in sports, and I was traveling a lot more independently. I was playing for teams in, in different states. I went to Australia by myself for the first time when I was 15. And so those really, those outside-of-school experience, ex excuse me, those outside-of-school experiences really helped build my, my confidence and my self-esteem. And I think that transferred over into to high school and my relationships with uh, my peers and my teachers there as well. Um, Anjali, you uh, mentioned earlier uh, accom accommodations that you had in high school. And so I'm wondering um, um, from the both of you, uh, in school, whether it's high school or into college, what kind of accommodations um, um, did you uh, need to use or what were available to you? Yeah, so I'm actually I'm really glad you asked that question because I, I actually neglected to, to answer it in the in the first. Probably the most important thing about her high school experience. <laughs> so my high school was completely inaccessible for students with disabilities, and so my first day of high school was a complete disaster. I asked for, um, a hall monitor for directions how to get to my homeroom, and they said, "Sure, you know, go straight down the hallway through the set of double doors, make your first left, and the classroom will be right in front of you." So I followed the directions, and sure enough, the classroom was right in front of me, but they had led me to a stairwell. So I was quite literally in a stairwell and could not get to my homeroom class on the first day of high school. And so this was one of many, many incidents that, that started to, to happen kind of throughout my, my high school experience. And it was one of those things where it was, it was a dis I felt it was a very big disappointment because I, I had not moved, you know, from the time that I first started kindergarten and, and elementary school, middle school. And so we, we had been trying to prepare the school administrators and, and um, special educators and all of that um, and, and, you know, all of, all of the 504 team for the fact that I was going to be coming up to high school and that I did not have any academic needs um, related to my disability so that I, w I would be in regular classes and that I wanted to go to college and that we were going to have to find ways to make the make everything accessible for me and by the time and they kept they just kept giving me the brush off and just kept saying oh yeah it'll be ready for you don't worry it'll be ready it'll be ready it'll be ready and then that's what happened on day one 
And unfortunately, it was more than just those the physical barriers that, uh, that I was facing, but it was also the attitudinal, attitudinal barriers from teachers and administrators and, you know, the principal, the superintendent. Um, there was an English teacher. This was day one of my sophomore year of, of high school who had to, at the time, one of the accommodations was that, that my classes were relocated from the inaccessible portions of the building to the one accessible wing of the high school. And so this particular teacher had to walk down a flight of stairs to this vacant classroom, which was where, where my class was, was to be held. And when she was taking role and, you know, going through who was, who was in the class on that particular day, um, she got to my name and said, what are you doing in an honors level English class? It's not like you can go to college anyway. And mm. this this was just, I mean, devastating. I mean, and, for, and then she went on to, to say, you know, really, you're just a major inconvenience to me. You should just be in special ed. I mean, it, and so she was calling me out in front of all of my friends, in front of, you know, in, in a very negative way, and just flat out didn't believe that, that I could achieve or that I could, you know, be successful in, in school. And um, and so it was that, that deep prejudice and, and uh, unfortunate stereotypes that, that many of the individuals that, that I encountered throughout my high school experience led me to actually file a federal lawsuit. Um, so I took on my district in, in federal courts um, because of discrimination on the, on the basis of disability. And so, uh, like I said, it was, ju it was both the physical inaccessibility and, and the attitudes. And it was ca uh, kind of the combination of, of both of those where it just was not a, not a very fun high school atmosphere or environment. Um, and, you know, and for me, the types of the things that I was asking for in terms of accommodation, they seemed fairly minimal. It was, it was literally to be able to get to my classes. Um, in, and to have them be in an accessible par part of the building. I mean, I, I, the other piece of it, too, that was frustrating was if I wanted to, say, join the yearbook club, they would have these, you know, hey, informational, stop by if you want to meet and if you're interested in joining the club, but then that meeting would be in an, an accessible location. So, I, I, you know, sport te high school sport teams, like extracurricular activities, all of that stuff was also very pretty much off limits for me. But I was also fighting the bigger fight of being able to get to my English class. So it was a, the, the lawsuit tried to, tried to cover all of those different things. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a powerful story there. And I think that we can all learn about... Um, the pre I think that there are many people listening who can relate to that kind of prejudice, and um, I think it says a lot that that you, um, as a, as a child, you and your family were confident enough to to really stand up and do something about it, Anjali. Yeah, thank you. And and just to kind of fill in um, what what ended up ultimately happening with that too, um, it was actually the first lawsuit um, where punitive and compensatory damages were awarded under the Americans with Disabilities Act um, in a public education case. So previous prior to this, there had been um, plenty of lawsuits related to ADA in an employment setting, but never in public ed. So because I did not have academic needs related to my disability, I was not on an IEP plan. I was on a 504 plan, which is commonly for more just physical accommodations that, that a student may need. Um, and so, and so, because of that, the legal protections and the types of laws that that kind of cover you and your rights as a student um, it, are different. And so that's why that's why that the, that case was filed in, under the Americans with Disabilities Act and and the uh, the Civil Rights Act. Made some history there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, Amanda, do you have any uh, anything to add in terms of accommodations that you had to that you needed through um, your schooling? My, my accommodations are all pretty pretty minor in comparison to a lawsuit. I was really lucky that I went to a newer high school, and they had experience um, with kids who had both 504s and IEPs before I had come in, and I never actually had to file an official 504 with the school. I was invited in early my freshman year to meet all of my teachers, uh, get acquainted with the principal, the school nurse, anyone that I might run into, and also have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with all of them about books and where my classes were going to be, where the best place for my locker would be, if I needed um, accessible desks or anything like that, which was a big deal, especially in chemistry and biology classes where you're doing, where you're doing labs and those types of things. Um, but like I said, I was, I was really lucky, and everything went off 100% perfectly, not a problem. Well, that's good. 
Um, uh, I do I'm getting... know that that's also that's a pretty unique experience. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but but it's a good unique experience to have in the grand scheme. Um, I'm getting uh, word that uh, some of the uh, listeners are having some trouble hearing um, uh, you, Anjali and Amanda. So if you just remember to speak up a little bit um, um, when when you answer the questions. Um, and uh, so getting back to it, so uh, sounds like high school was tons of fun. Um, moving into college, uh, so uh, where did you all um, individually go go to school? Uh, so <laughs> you, you can handle that. <laughs> yep, I'm on it. So for me, it, it actually connects to it connects to some of my lawsuit story as well. Um, so for me, because of the the fight that the of having to fight for access and so forth. Um, when it came time to apply for colleges and university, I really wanted to go somewhere where the fight had already been fought and where I could just focus on being a college kid and, um, you know, and, and succeeding in my academics and so forth. So at the time, also, I was, um, I was actually more involved with ski racing than I was with wheelchair racing at the time. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to go to a university that had um, collegiate level adaptive sports. And so since th these were some of my requirements, the, the list became rather short really quickly. And um, ultimately, I ended up applying and, and attending the University of Illinois. And um, the cat's out of the bag now, but uh, Amanda also went to the University of Illinois. At, um, as of right now, um, there's only two universities that actually offer collegiate level wheelchair track, and Illinois is one of them. Um, in terms of physical accessibility, the University of Illinois um, was the first public university to open its doors to students with disabilities back in 1948, long before any rules and laws and, and all of that even existed. And so for me, the huge draw there was that every campus building was uh, was accessible, and and that I was not going to have to deal with the same fight that I had that I had faced um, in high school. And it's not to say that the university is not perfect with regards to access, because there's certainly like anywhere, there's always room for improvement and and so forth. But it was so nice for me to, you know, I I, I always would would tell the story that I felt like I was a kid in a candy store the moment that I stepped foot on that campus, because then all of a sudden, you know, the more than 2,000 student organizations were all of a sudden accessible to me. I could major in anything I wanted to because all of the buildings were accessible and so all of a sudden it was just this whole new world um, where where I could you know where I could really thrive academically and also have the opportunity to, to get more more involved and to take sport to the to the next competitive level so Anjali ruined the surprise but we did both attend the University of Illinois and my reasons for applying there were very, very similar to hers. I was becoming more and more involved in wheelchair sports and adaptive athletics as I was getting older and was actually named as an alternate to the women's national wheelchair basketball team my senior year of college. So I was heavily recruited by the former wheelchair basketball coach at the University of Illinois and attended on a scholarship, which was very, very cool for me because as a kid, I had no idea that wheelchair sports scholarships were even a thing that existed anywhere. Yeah, that's, I, I didn't even, I didn't know that the University of Illinois was, uh, was so, um, I guess, groundbreaking in that way with uh, uh, people with disabilities in the sports front. Um, out of curio curiosity, what's the other school? Um, so for wheelchair racing, it's University of Arizona. Oh, and there are there are more there are more schools that also that Amanda can speak a little bit more to this than I, than I probably can. But there are more more universities and colleges that offer um, collegiate level wheelchair basketball. Um, it's just track and track and field. Then the numbers are a little bit smaller in terms of university options. That's and I don't know absolutely true. Many, yeah, I don't know how many we're up to in terms of collegiate programs. Do you know ballpark? I am. I don't have a an official number um, because there have been a few that have been added, a few that have moved back to clubs. So it's somewhere between a half dozen and ten schools that mm -hmm. offer collegiate wheelchair basketball teams, um, both on the men and women side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a. Uh... That's good. That's good to know. I think that there are going to be some um, some kids out there uh, who who are interested in in the in the sports who might be looking to go to college and and might be inquiring as to which ones uh, would be the best ones for for these kind of athletics. 
So in terms of going to the Olympics and becoming a, a professional athlete in that way, um, was it just through your, your experience being a college athlete that just evolved to that point? Yeah, so my story is a little bit different. Um, and so for me, when going through middle school and high school, I was really competing in, in, in sports mostly for fun. I was, I was competing. Um, I was starting to, to take the competition more seriously with skiing throughout high school. And I always thought that I would actually go to the Paralympic Games for winter for winter sports for for skiing than than I would would ever have imagined for wheelchair racing. Um, but then ultimately, my decision to go to the University of Illinois. There are no mountains in in the flatlands of of Champaign, Illinois, and so I ended up um, ended up kind of giving up that that sort of competitive side of of ski racing. I, I attempted to fly to different events my, my first two years in college and and try to get as much time on snow um, to balance out the dry land and weight room training and and stuff that I was doing. But it really was not the most effective plan for me. Um, and and I also, you know, d during my undergrad work at, at Illinois, I was, uh, like I said before, since I was a kid in a candy store, I was just saying yes to so many student leadership opportunities and um, was really just enjoying what I, what I always call making up for lost time in terms of the aspects of the social aspects of high school that I had missed out on. So athletics really kind of went, went onto the back burner for me throughout those first four years um, of my time at Illinois. Ironically, when I started graduate school, so, I, so I, I actually did three degrees at the University of Illinois, my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD. And when I started my master's program at Illinois, I actually hated it. Um, and I really was not sure that this was something that I wanted to continue to pursue. I just felt like it was not a good fit for me and all, and all, all these different things. And so during, as I was kind of struggling with that and trying to figure out the direction, that, that, the, the career direction that my life should take, I went knocking on the, the, coach, the coach's door for the track team and said, hi, I'd like to join the team. Um, and, and he was like, well, okay, uh, you know, most of the time people start graduate school and they tend to, you know, scale off uh, on some of these big athletic commitments and so forth. And he said, you know, you can't, you can't just do this part time. You know, if, if you, if you're going to join the team, I want you to be here, you know, six days a week training and, and, you know, and, and we're going to have big goals here and, 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 and high expectations. And I said, yes, I understand that. And for me, the reason for, for wanting, wanting to kind of go back to that was, um, sport always brought a sense of stability in my life. So when I was going through that lawsuit in high school, it was it was because of my friends in sport and because of the the involvement that I had with downhill skiing and 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 sport became that positive healthy outlet for me to be able to deal with all all of the the rest of everything that was going on and and to deal and to channel that frustration into something positive. And so when I explained all of this to the coach, he was like, okay, sure. So um, that January, I, I joined the team, and then six, six months later, so it was that summer, I made my first national team um, in, in, two th in the summer of 2007 and had the opportunity to represent our country at the Parapan American Games, which were in um, Rio at that time. And then from there, and continued with the, that athletic trajectory, um, ultimately making the team for Beijing, and and then um, stayed stayed with it through throughout my PhD program, and um, compete and also competed in in London. I came into the university, unlike Anjali, as a committed two sport athlete on a wheelchair basketball scholarship, and also as a as a walk on member of the track and road racing team. So. I didn't quite have the time to to pick up all of the the clubs and organizations that she did because I was balancing classes and a part time job with two to three training sessions per day, and I was 100% convinced that I was going to be the next wheelchair basketball star and go to the 2008 Paralympic Games to play basketball, until I was bribed in 2006 to do my very first marathon. Um, which wasn't exactly love at first sight, but it grew into a, a pretty loving relationship between me and marathons and made my first Paralympic team in 2008 to go to Beijing. And after that, it was a, began to become a little bit more difficult to balance the two sports. And basketball became more of, more of a hobby for me, and racing took over um, a little bit more of a, a full-time position. Yeah, it's it's always interesting, at least for me, to to kind of hear how 
um, one finds themselves in in different uh, positions in, in their lives, you know, um, uh, especially especially in, in your stories here. Um, it's a so we're getting closer to the end of the hour. I don't. I want to make sure we get to some uh, specific questions that were asked by the community. Um, we could listen to you guys just talk about your lives and your experiences all day long. Um, uh, but for the sake of time. Um, there's one question that I thought uh, you could speak to pretty well. Um, how do you deal with nerve pain associated with the with the uh, TM? Um, has rigorous uh, rigorous workout helped lessen any pain that exists? Yeah, so I can I can kind of take that question, um, Sam. And so for me, acquiring transverse myelitis at, at such a young age, which which now now I, I actually think that both Amanda and I would would actually fall under the the umbrella of acute flaccid myelitis based on our presentation of of our of transverse myelitis in, in both of us. Um, generally speaking, most kids who who acquire it don't end up having the, the same levels of nerve pain and, and so forth. However, in my case, um, I, so I didn't have any nerve pain problems or issues or anything really all through my childhood and growing up until until more recent years. So um, for me, after after the London 2012 games, I, I have ha start, started to have a series of, of some health complications and and um, surgeries and things like that. And um, it's kind of been kind of through the aftermath and, and so forth of that that I've now now been been presented with this challenge of neuropathic nerve pain, and it's been it it has been definitely something that's been very challenging to manage and um you know i've tried different medications i've tried um lots of different things um but i will say that the 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 component of consistent physical activity has been ha, for me has been a tremendous help there, yes there are some days where my nerve pain if my ler nerve pain level is is super super high then it makes it hard to do to do any type of of physical activity, and so that's where that's where the athlete in me gets frustrated. But I've also learned trying to learn to to realize that even if I am able to get onto a hand cycle or to get into the pool and to do something even at a at a more moderate or an easier jogging pace or or a lesser rate, just that consistency of doing something. There's something about it that, for me, it, it helps to it helps to kind of keep keep that nerve nerve pain kind of at bay, and help to helps to helps to regulate and, and kind of keep it keep it more manageable. Amanda, do you have any anything to add uh, for this question? I actually don't have anything to add on this one. Like Anjali said, most children who acquire transverse myelitis at a young age don't experience any nerve pain. So I have been very fortunate. Um, to not actually have to deal with that as a complication. Uh, there was a question that came up um, here, uh, and Anjali, you kind of mentioned uh, uh, swimming and I guess hydrotherapy um, in your in your last answer. But it's actually a a man asking a question for his wife, um, an older lady, um, who recently had an, uh, uh, was diagnosed with uh, neuroimmune disease. And has issues with walking and and balance and mobility, and um, that their uh, their physician has um, suggested that they increase uh, exercise program, including hydrotherapy, and that in his opinion, the um, the physician's opinion, that that was the only way to recover as fully as one can. Um, so, do you uh, either uh, you do either of you have any? Um, experience with much hydrotherapy or, or water exercise and um, uh, any opinions about how it's helped you uh, in your recovery or, or if it's had any effect at all? When I was doing my physical therapy right after my diagnosis, I did quite a bit of it uh, because my physical therapist thought that it was a great opportunity for me to increase my um, my strength and my um, flexibility without being in a high impact environment, but I haven't done very much since I was a young child. Um, and for me, um, you know, I, like I mentioned, it, it, there's different, there, you know, there's different levels of, of getting involved in the pool, whether it whether it's like doing laps or whether it's doing exercises, more more from a physical therapy, hydrotherapy sort of perspective. I've really enjoyed um, having having a physical therapy program that was designed around around being in the pool, especially for recovering from surgeries. Um, for me, it, that's been really helpful. Um, and so, like I mentioned, after um, 
the London 2012 games, I, I've had multiple, multiple surgeries, and um, and I started working with a physical therapist who was able to to help me to come up with different exercises and things that I could do because my because my kind of fatigue level um, w- was I was I was fatiguing super quickly when I was trying to do like hand cycling or getting back in my racing wheelchair and and things of that nature. So I was able to actually do more in the pool than I was able to do outside of the pool in more traditional therapy methods. And so for me that was that was very, very exciting. Um, and one other thing, too, that I wanted to go back to that question on the nerve pain, I, I did forget to, to add in that as a kid, I did have these occasional sharpshooting weird nerve pains is, is kind of what I, what I would call them. And it was funny, though, because not knowing at the time, not knowing other kids with transverse myelitis, I just thought that that was just a weird thing that only I experienced. Because it was, it was always one of those once once in a blue moon type of experiences, and I could never really figure out whether it was a positional thing, because I don't think it was. I mean, I think it was just once in a while I would get these really weird sharp shoot, shooting nerve pains that would kind of go to, run down the, the inner part of my leg and, and would, would just go all the way down. And, and when I would ask my doctors or my parents, everybody just thought I was crazy because they, they, they you know, felt they were like, well, no, I mean, you're paralyzed, so, so there's no way that that could, be, that could be the case. What I've learned, and I've learned so much more about transverse myelitis in, in these past few years um, because of, because of the, the recent health complications that I've had, and and I've actually learned that, that that's a transverse myelitis thing, and and I and I just realized, hey, who knew? Um, and so so I just wanted to add that. Yep, mm-hmm. that's absolutely true. I forgot about that as well. I remember when Anjali and I were roommates for quite a few years at the University of Illinois, and I remember talking to her about them because I had never met anyone else that experienced them either. And when I brought them up to my doctors, my doctors had always just treated me like I had a complete spinal cord injury. So their response was, oh, it must just be a spasm or something like that. But it's it's true. It was a, a sharp shooting pain just at or below my sensation level that would only last for a few seconds, and they'd come sporadically. Hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, it's interesting to hear the um, perspective from you who have had a uh, uh, living with TM and, and how that feels, especially starting as a child. Um, uh, one last question. Uh, uh, I've been very interested in hand cycling. I don't really know where to start with this and how. Um, do either of you have any uh, uh, good suggestions, whether it be uh, as a child or even an adult um, um, with a disability, and how to really jump into into um, adaptive sports? I do. So there are several amazing resources that are out there. Um, so the two that I'm going to mention are Paralympic Sport Clubs and also Chapters of Disabled Sports USA. So if you go to U.S. Paralympics, P-A-R-A-L-Y-M-P-I-C-S dot org, and you scroll down on their on their page, there's a there's a big um, kind of large box that says find a club. And when you click on that, you can actually search by location. Um, and, and this is this is right now um, because this is a U.S. Um, organization. It is, it is um, only for for those in, in the United States and, and states here, but you can search to find different chapters and so forth through there. Um, in terms of other opportunities, there's also Disabled Sports USA, dsusa.org, and you can do the same thing. You can search for chapters in, in your area. And I know that we have some international listeners and, and members, and if for anyone looking for international resources, there's um, the kind of the, the overarching governing body of the U.S. Paralympics is called the International Paralympic Committee, and I and and um, while I don't while there is not a, a sort of interactive na- international map, um, I would be happy to to point anyone in the right direction with at least with a key contact in the country where where you live to help to to connect you with programs um, where you can you know try out different sports whether it be hand cycling or you know, wheelchair racing, swimming, et cetera. And because one of the one of the beauties is that with these different chapters and sport clubs, they already have the specialized equipment in most cases and you can then try it out before you're committed to, you know, in, investing in equipment for your own, for for yourself and you can try many different sports. I mean that was both something that I was very fortunate growing up with where where I got involved with these different chapters and that was how I learned about all the different sports that were out there and, and found the ones that I liked. Anjali pretty much covered it 
all there. She is, she's right, the organizations are a great opportunity to learn about and try out different sports. They're fantastic for athletes of all different levels, from beginners all the way up to elite. And because adaptive athletic equipment is so expensive, it is fantastic to get involved with some of these organizations. So you get the opportunity to to try out different sports, try out different equipment before you commit to buying something yourself. Yeah, that, that's an important thing to note. Um, uh, we're going to uh, close out the podcast today. I really want to thank uh, you both, uh, Anjali and Amanda, for, for your time today. I think I can speak for all of the listeners that um, um, you both are, are very inspiring people, and we just want to thank you for sharing your time today and your stories and your experiences with us and the community. Um, thank you to the TMA for, for this platform that we all have to, uh, to share stories and to, to hear expert guidance on, on different topics. And thank you to Chagai Pharmaceuticals for their support of this podcast series. Um, wish everybody a good week. And until next month and the next podcast, uh, uh, everybody stay well. month and the